Okay, our next speaker is Lee Spencer White, talking about Joe the Slave, who became an Alamo legend. Lee is a seventh generation Texan. I think that's what somebody, Andres pointed out this morning, somebody was a seventh generation Texan, so it's been here a long time. Uh, she had a fourth great grandfather who died in defense of the Alamo. Over the past 20 years, Lee has founded the Alamo Descendants, Alamo Defender Descendants Association and has researched the Alamo across several states and Mexico. She's an active preservationist and was nominated for the Governor's 2006 Texas Women's Hall of Fame Award. She's been interviewed several times. Uh, she serves on the board of the former Texas Rangers Association and the Friends of the Texas Historical Commission. She is the co-author of the upcoming book, Last Soul Standing, and historical na narrative about Joe, a slave owned by famed Alamo commander, William Barrett Travis. Lee is a, a featured speaker in, in many places in Texas. She's been a historical consultant for the History Channel, Derg Films, Derg, and BBC. She resides on a South Texas ranch, sounds appropriate, with her husband Larry and their daughter Sam. Please help me in welcoming Lee. Hello, actually I now live in Fredericksburg. I moved north. I'm a migrant worker. <laughs> Well, our story, uh, Ron J. Jackson Jr. is my co-author, and together we wrote a book about a slave inside the Alamo. Um, at the time, we were foolish enough to think maybe we could do it. Uh, after researching a little bit, we found out no one else had done a biography about a slave and certainly not Alamo. So if you can imagine yourself enslaved inside the Alamo, which I find interesting since that's the symbol of liberty, um, we chatted about that for a little while in the beginning and we talked about different people inside the Alamo, different defenders, just chatting. And one of us just said to the other one, well, well what about Joe? Maybe we can find his family. And I said, oh, that'd be great, because we could have him inside the Alamo for a ceremony. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We're just chatting, very naive about it. And somehow it morphed into, we can do this. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we've often uh, regretted saying that. But anyway, so we started, and I believe it was um, uh, the day after March 6th, 7th, somewhere in there, after the ceremonies in the Alamo had ended, we decided, well, let's go check this out. Well, where do we start? I said, well, let's start at the epicenter of Austin's colony. You know, let's look, let's look there, you know, Austin County. Because we had what everyone else had. We knew the story of Joe, okay? He was the enslaved manservant of William Barrett Travis, commander of the Alamo. Somehow he came and uh, gave the story of the Alamo battle and then disappeared. That's what everyone knows. That's it. Um, they might have, if they're a scholar, they might know of Travis's diary and they may know of the, um, uh oh, I'm supposed to be doing this. Hold on. Uh oh. I, I need a technical assistant. Okay, there we go. Okay. <laughs> or they may have known about the ad, you know, uh, which, which uh, discusses um, the runaway. And um, because after Travis died, Joe went into the estate of William Barrett Travis. And um, there was an executor appointed, John Rice Jones, the first postmaster general. And Joe decides to run away on a very great day, which is a day that everyone's busy at a party celebrating the, the uh, victory at San Jacinto. So we know basically what, he, what um, he was riding. We know what he's wearing. We know a little bit about what he looks like. I found it very interesting in this, though, and I haven't heard anyone else mention it, but I thought how odd they named the horse in the ad. I thought Shannon... Shannon must have been well known across Texas. Why would you mention the name of the horse? So uh, we, we started with this. And um, so we decided we'll just take off for, for uh, the epicenter of Texas, Austin's Colony. 
And we walked into the Austin County Courthouse and said, um, do you have a probate for an Isaac Mansfield? Because Isaac Mansfield is mentioned in Travis's diary. Yes, we do. <laughs> so, Ron and I sat down. We wait for the, the manila folder to come out. And we decided we'd take turns on flipping the pages. Okay, you open it. I'll turn the first page. Okay, you take the... I and mean, we're sitting here doing this. We're so excited. And uh, <clears throat> sure enough, we turn the page, and there is where it states... The sale of Joe talks about Isaac Mansfield. It goes on to discuss that uh, uh, Cummings buys him for $411. We're just like, oh my God, bingo, bingo. This is wonderful. So <clears throat> we look to the bottom of the page, and there's an original signature of William Barrett Travis. Now we're shaking. You know, we're so excited. We're like, oh my God, we can't believe this should be in the archives. But we're, we, we can... But we have to get a copy first. We're not going to tell anybody until we get this copy first. And then we'll call Austin. And so we take this paper, <clears throat> which we're both trembling. We both want to scream like little girls, you know, like, oh my God, we found, I mean, what is the, the first place you go to? People have been looking for Joe and they've all known these two facts that we know, which is, you know, Isaac Mansfield. They knew that 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 was a connection with that name from the diary and we, they knew about the ad but no one apparently went to Austin County to look I was like that can't be we can't be the first ones well apparently we were so we're sitting there now with this document we're, we're, we, we've hit pay dirt okay we're just so excited we, we thought if we, nothing else happens with this we've got this so <clears throat> I said we, we have to get a copy Ron says but they'll see the signature on the bottom and they won't let us take the copy. I said, I know, but we've got to go for it. <laughs> so we go over to a little girl who's about 18 years old in Belleville, Texas at Austin County Courthouse, which is a wonderful courthouse. But uh, uh, we carry it over to her and said, may we have a copy? I'm trying to be as my poker face that I can get, you know. May we have a copy? And she goes, oh, these old documents, I hate copying them. They're so crumbly and falling apart. And she opens up the Xerox machine and she goes, <laughs> and we're just frozen. Our eyes are like this. Oh my God. Oh my God. We've just killed Travis again. So anyway, um, <clears throat> we get our copy. We whistle all the way home. We're so excited. We're like, maybe we can do this. You know, I think we were still naive and excited enough to think we could do it. Well, as time goes by, um, let me see what I have next. As time goes by, we're now really trying to look at the estate. Where did Joe go? You know, the we, we're looking at um, William Fairfax Gray's stories, you know, his diary that uh, where Joe was interviewed and and uh, they took down his story we're looking we're trying to find anyone that may have mentioned him but mainly we're looking at the estate you know where did he go what did he happen to him well we found that John Rice Jones had hired him out to a man named Holtzclaw well Bernard Holtzclaw and his partner had a tavern in Washington on the Brazos and um, Joe worked for them for a period of time we found it kind of interesting that Bernard Holsclaw was a previous overseer for Andrew Jackson's plantation, the Hermitage, in Nashville. All these people start connecting. It's just amazing in these stories how it, it's a definitely a very small world. So, you know, now we've got Andrew Jackson tied into the story, and we're like, all right, how can we find out again about the runaway this is a, an artist rendition by a friend of mine gary zaboli and he's showing john rice jones hunting joe well i was puzzled because it doesn't seem like he hunted him very long you know he runs one ad i'm like are we just not finding those newspapers i mean did he just give up in two or three days maybe, maybe he didn't care maybe he thought well you know it was, I, who knows i mean his wife is very ill and then his wife dies um just after this so we're back to looking at this ad again. <clears throat> well, let's 
try to find out who this Isaac Mansfield is. Maybe that'll be a lead. Uh, I, he said, well, where do you think we should start? I said, I guess Missouri. Uh, you know, seems like everyone, you know, you're going back and you're like, okay, well, let's just try the obvious first. And uh, so, so we started looking at citizen records. Isaac Mansfield, thank God, is an unusual name. It popped up. It popped up in where else but Missouri. So we investigated him, found out that he was a very successful, uh, had a very successful tin operation until the collapse in Missouri. At that point, um, he tried politics. That didn't work. So he travels to Texas with Joe. And how we know Joe, Joe's, and, and uh, Joe's mother and siblings go with them because we find that in the probate records. We also find the previous owners of Joe in that probate record. That probate record in Austin County was a jewel. It helped us tremendously. So now we're just, you know, look at this runaway guy. We're like, okay, well, we know basically where Joe came from. We know his previous owner. He still disappears on us, and I don't think we can do very much with this story. You know, I don't know where else to look. We're kind of at a dead end here. Um, I said, well, let's put together the Travis estate. You know, let's look at that again. And, uh, uh uh-oh, that's too soon. But anyway, so let's look at the Travis estate. So we did. Well, I found it to be totally incomplete. And uh, no one ever mentioned this. All these historians I have dinner with all the time, not one of them ever said that the Travis estate's not whole. But when I looked down, I went, oh, this, this, this is just a small part. Well, so I started going from county to county to county. Ron and I started traveling again. And um, in each county, we just start with book A and just read them all. And we do that with any collection. We just start reading everything and just taking in great volumes, hoping to sift some little nugget out. So uh, we did the same thing. We, we started going from county to county. I actually put together Travis's estate in whole. I was very surprised there was three executors and it took nearly 25 years to close it. They never told me that. That was new. And I thought, hmm, is this intentional? Are they playing it out so the kids can get money? You know, you, you start wondering, are the, why didn't the executors try to close it earlier? So then we went to Alabama to try to answer some of those questions and um, found that there was records there in the orphan records in Alabama showing where um, the kids inherited and went to Texas the same year that the estate is closed and also that they, they sued their, um, uh, I guess the executors of, of their estate um, for monies over one particular slave. We don't find Joe. We track everywhere. We're looking all through Alabama. We go to, through all the traditional legends. We go through all the paperwork. We're looking. We find two or three little documents, which was very, very interesting. And uh, I'll go back to those in a minute. But one Christmas Eve, Ron is sitting in, in the library at the University of Oklahoma. And as usual, we, you know, we both tend to close the library down they blink the lights like we're in a bar to go home and uh, he's flipping through these because we're you know we're looking at background information for uh, St. Louis and and um, he finds this book by William Wells Brown who was a a well-known abolitionist and a contemporary of uh, Frederick Douglass he also was the first African-American novelist and he's reading this book and he comes across a sentence or two that says about his escape and his family. And he says, and my mother, Elizabeth, my brother, Joe, my brother, Milford, and my two sisters were taken to Texas by a man named Isaac Mansfield. Bingo. There it is. We're like, what are the odds of that happening? You know, I mean, that's just providence. I mean, it's just amazing. So from there, we now can fill in Joe's childhood. How did Joe get to the Alamo? Now we know, you know, because this particular man tells his life story about how he escaped, how he went to Canada, how he took the name William Wells Brown. 
and he tells childhood memories, which would be the same as Joe would have experienced. One of my favorites is a story about Uncle Dinky. I know that's not <laughs> Uncle Dinky. He was an African conjurer or magic man, a voodoo man. And um, he was not born in the South. He was from Africa. And Dr. Jones, the man that um, Joe was raised by on that particular plantation, um, would have experienced, to me, this is a very odd story, but uh, and I debate even telling it because it's kind of odd, but I couldn't resist it. Um, there's a story where the overseer named Cook arrives. It's his first day on the job, and he asked Dr. Um, Young, well, what's that slave over there doing, that, that large one? He's just walking around. He's not working or anything. Dr. Young says, he's a gentleman at large. And all the, all the other people just are totally quiet. And Cook asks a few more questions. And he's like, well, I can tell you one thing. You be here tomorrow morning. Everyone be here tomorrow morning because I'm going to lay down the law of how we're going to run this plantation right now. <clears throat> so the next morning, everyone's lined up. You know, everyone's ready to go to the fields except Uncle Dinky. He's not there. Well, Cook is all mad. He's, he grabs his whip. He starts towards Uncle Dinky's cabin. Uncle Dinky meets him at the door. Just opens the door as soon as he gets there. Follows Cook out. And Cook says, you go into the barn because I'm going to give you some lashings for being, you know, not following orders, not doing what you're supposed to do. You're going to be beaten. And Uncle Dinky looks at everybody in the crowd. He says, if he lays one hand on me, the top of this barn's going to explode. Everyone's shaking. They're like, oh, my God, because they all know he's a very powerful magic person. He's a voodoo priest. So, every, no one goes to the fields. They're all just going to wait and watch. So they um, go into the barn. Nothing happens. Total silence. No yelling. No screaming. No screams. No hitting. Nothing. In a few minutes, Uncle Dinky walks out. The overseer cook walks out. Part ways. Nothing's done total silence no one is dares ask what happened until a little bit later and uh, so several people had gone to um the old old grandfather that lived with uncle dinky who's like 99 years old uh or, or so william Wells brown says and said what happened what happened he said i can't tell you i cannot tell you but uncle dinky stayed up all night with his snake skins and his oil and his prayers and he was praying to the devil and everyone's like oh my god so a few weeks go by the old grandfather's not gonna say a word well some lady from the kitchen brought some really sweet pies and she gave him some pies and he told her all about it okay <laughs> leave it to a woman to get the truth out so here's the lowdown Un uncle dinky Stayed up all night, prayed to the devil. They walked into the barn, and he told Cook, look over into the corner of the barn. Cook looked over. He saw the devil dancing. And Uncle Dinky said, you are going to be visited by the devil. He's going to take you there with him. And Cook's pleading, please, no, 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 no. If you'll just let me go, I, we won't say another word. Just let me go. Just let me go. And that's how they walked out of the barn. And after that, no one ever bothered Uncle Dinky. So those kind of stories are what this gentleman gave us, which are part of Joe's story. Can you imagine? I mean, there's dozens of these wonderful stories that Joe experienced as a child. He was also terrified of Indians because of Indian attacks in Marthasville. Um, there was so much rich history that we brought that he brought forward to the Alamo, and one has to think what was his thoughts, you know, as he's a 
you know, being a manservant to Travis, which of course entails from everything from gathering firewood to helping with meals to delivering messages to polishing your boots to saddling your horse, you know, whatever it takes. He had already seen so much and uh, that even though he was only about 19 years old, he had already seen so much of life and so much violence in life 